What's happening, Lions fans? I am back with part 5 of why Matthew Stafford can be the one to lead us to the promised land. And before we begin, I'd like to apologize for yet another mistake I made in my last video. I said that Ben Roethlisberger had 14 pro bowlers on defense, but he actually had 13 pro bowlers on defense. I listed 13, but I for some reason wrote that he had 14. So forgive my mistake. Also, before we begin, there's a lie that Rob Parker has spread, and it must be debunked right now because I'm afraid for the people that have seen him say it and bought it and will be using it against Stafford. Rob Parker said the Lions went four and out in the playoff game against the Cowboys on the final drive. That is not true, and it should not be used to show how unclutch Stafford is. I have on the screen right now a play-by-play -play sheet off of ProFootballReference.com for the final Lions drive of the game. I count the Lions running 10 plays on that drive. So somebody correct me, but I thought four and out means you ran four plays and then the drive ended. So how is running 10 plays going four and out? I mean, you can knock Stafford for the fumbles that he had, and one of them, the Lions were lucky to get back, but Stafford did not go four and out. I don't know, maybe Rob Parker meant to just say they didn't score on it. But, I don't know. Somebody correct me. Like, I I just thought four and out meant that you ran four plays and the drive was over. Stafford did actually get the ball inside of Cowboys territory. And I'll even link you guys visual evidence of Stafford running more plays than four in the description. So, Rob Parker, you should be absolutely ashamed of yourself. You're getting paid to be a journalist, and you're spreading a lie. And this is a lie that you've spread on Colin Cowherd's show and on Undisputed multiple times, and I've yet to see you correct yourself. So if anyone does have a video of him correcting himself, please link it to me. So this is one lie that I have completely busted you on, Rob Parker. It just leaves me wondering how many more lies you've told on air that you haven't been busted for. So Rob Parker, f*** you and your stupid f Well, now that I got my mini rant out of the way, let's begin. As you can see by the title, we'll be breaking down how clutch Stafford can be. And by clutch, you might be thinking about all the fourth quarter comebacks he's made. And those are great. And that's certainly part of him being clutch. But I'm not just talking about the fourth quarter comebacks. I also mean clutch on third down, clutch in the red zone. And also, he's more clutch in the playoffs than you'd think. So anyways, let's start with his third down passing stats since 2011. As you can see, since 2011, Stafford is ranked 5th in 3rd down touchdown passes, 2nd in 3rd down interceptions, 15th in completion percentage on 3rd down, and his 3rd down conversion percentage on passes is 38.4%. Now, the completion percentage is not all that beautiful, and the interceptions aren't either, but what is beautiful is the 38.4%. Stafford's 38.4 third down conversion percentage on passes is only 2.1% higher than the league average during this time frame. However, it's important to note that the difference between being top 7, where Stafford would have ranked the Lions during this time frame, and bottom 7 is extremely small. Take a look at this chart of the third down conversion by passing percentages of the top 7 and the bottom 7 teams. Now, you might be wondering, I said Stafford would have had the Lions ranked 7th, but the Lions aren't on this list. When I used pro football reference, this whole list, like, the teams includes every throw from every player during the time frame. So the Lions would have been 38.3, but Stafford was 38.4. So I hope that clarifies that. But anyways, just look at the difference between top 7 and bottom 7. The seventh best team at converting third downs by passing during this time frame is the Colts at 38.4%, and the Cardinals are the seventh worst team at 33.7%. The difference between these two teams is not even 5%. Basically, this just shows how fine of a line it is between being really good and really bad. If you just shrink this down to one game, the difference between being top seven and bottom seven is basically one play. This pertains to Stafford in the sense that he is capable of giving you that one extra play on third down. So we know his third down completion percentage isn't all that great and his interception rate is a little high, but he is above league average at converting on third down. I will say, and I will admit, that he is extremely hot and extremely cold on third down, and we'll even see that with his red zone passing stats. But this begs the question, is his third down passing good enough to win a Super Bowl? Yes, it is. 
if I average all of Stafford's passing stats on third down over the eight-year span that we are covering, he averages 8.75 third down touchdown passes, five and a half third down interceptions, and on third down passes, he is converting them at a 38.4% clip. So I decided to make a chart of Super Bowl winning quarterbacks that had similar third down stats in their respective Super Bowl runs. I placed a plus sign next to the conversion percentage if it ranked higher than league average during that year. And I placed a minus sign if it ranked below league average during that year. And I placed an equal sign next to it if the conversion percentage ranked equal to league average that year. So for example, Brad Johnson was below league average that year at 32.3%. So I put a minus sign next to it. In 2004, Tom Brady's 42.8% was above league average in 2004. So I put a plus sign next to it, etc., etc. Anyways, Stafford edges out Brad Johnson, Ben Roethlisberger, Tom Brady, and Russell Wilson in third down touchdown passes in their respective Super Bowl runs. And he edges out Brad Johnson, Ben Roethlisberger, Eli Manning, and Russell Wilson in third down conversion percentage. So what does this tell us? I would have to think it tells us that he is good enough on third down to be a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Compared to these quarterbacks I've brought up, his conversion percentage shows he's certainly good enough on third down. So now let's move on to his red zone efficiency. Here's Matthew Stafford's red zone passing stats from 2011 to 2018. He ranks sixth in red zone touchdown passes second in red zone interceptions, and has a completion percentage of 53.3% in there. So one of the knocks I've seen on Stafford is that he's no good in the red zone. But that's just not true. If he's bad in the red zone, how is it that in this time frame that I've listed, how is it possible that he's ranked sixth in red zone touchdown passes if he's not good in the red zone? I will agree that the interceptions are a little high and the completion percentage isn't beautiful, but... Would you all agree that when you get into the red zone, the objective is to score a touchdown more than it is to have a beautiful completion percentage? Theoretically, they should go hand in hand. But as I mentioned, on his third down passing attempts, it's all or nothing with him. He's very hot and he's very cold. Do I maybe wish Stafford was a little more consistent? Sure, yeah, I'll give y'all that one. But the good still far outweighs the bad. And I want to show you guys just how deadly he can be in the red zone with the right players and the right personnel. Here are Stafford's best seasons in the red zone. In these seasons, Stafford was top five in red zone touchdown passes. So these seasons are done and over, and a lot has changed since these seasons. But these three seasons show just how much damage he can do in the red zone with the right players. He needs a Calvin Johnson or an Anquan Bolton type of guy. Calvin was just a physical freak of nature, while Bolden was just a smart player who knew how to get open. But just give him a good big body receiver and just a competent enough big body tight end, and he can do some damage. Notice the tight ends I listed. How dominant would you consider Brandon Pettigrew, Tony Scheffler, or Joseph Fourier? None of these guys are that great. They never were. But Stafford had these three players tied for second on the Lions in these particular years in red zone touchdown receptions. And he even had a second year Eric Ebron catching five red zone touchdowns, which was third on the Lions in 2015. He has an argument for being one of the most dominant tight ends now that he has Andrew Luck throwing him the ball, and Andrew Luck loves tight ends, but in 2015, it's hard to argue that he was even a top 15 tight end. So basically, you just give Stafford a good and maybe even great receiver, and just a competent enough big body tight end, and he'll do damage. One potential counter-argument is that if he's so great, then he shouldn't need guys like Calvin Johnson to be effective in the red zone. Well, I'm glad you said that. But here's the thing. Aaron Rodgers has had Jordy Nelson. Tom Brady has had Randy Moss. And then it was Rob Gronkowski. Andrew Luck in 2014 had T.Y. Hilton and a couple of competent big-body tight ends like Stafford. Ben Roethlisberger has had Antonio Brown. Patrick Mahomes this year had a top-three receiver and a top-three tight end in Tyra Kill and Travis Kelsey. I could go on and on, but do you all see the picture? Pretty much everyone has had one or more go-to targets in the red zone. So why should Stafford get docked for needing something that literally every good quarterback has? But ever since Megatron retired, Stafford has failed to be in the top 10 in red zone touchdown passes. So it just shows how Stafford isn't any good with Megatron, right? 
Not exactly. Let's take a look at Aaron Rodgers for a second. Aaron Rodgers lost Jordy Nelson to a torn ACL in the 2015 season. Now, Aaron Rodgers is an all-time great, as I've said in this series. But surely, him of all people should be able to make up for not having Jordy Nelson, right? Not entirely. Here's Aaron Rodgers' stats from the 2014 season when he had Jordy Nelson. I want to show the stats before and after the injury so you viewers at least have some perspective. So you see, Aaron Rodgers won the MVP that season, and he was dominant. He was top five in red zone touchdown passes, just like normal. But be ready to be stunned at how much losing Jordy Nelson would end up affecting Aaron Rodgers. Take a look at Aaron Rodgers' red zone stats in 2015. This was probably his worst season in the red zone, and just probably his worst season in general other than the 2018 season. He went from top 5 in red zone touchdown passes to out of the top 10. And he had just a 50% completion percentage in the red zone. And he did not have Jordy Nelson. And just look at all of those career lows he had for the season. They're indicated by asterisks. And losing Jordy Nelson was pretty much the only difference between Rodgers' receiving core in 2015 and 2014. Andrew Corliss was only playing five games, but I don't think any of you viewers would have viewed that as that much of a loss. So just think about this. If losing Jordy Nelson, who is not as good as Calvin Johnson, had this kind of effect on Aaron Rodgers' red zone efficiency and his stats in general, just imagine the kind of effect not having Calvin Johnson would have on Stafford. So hopefully this shows my point. Everyone needs a good red zone target, even the best, like Aaron Rodgers. So now, let's talk about Stafford's playoff performances. The only game in which Stafford did not play that great was against the Seahawks. But check out these st receiving stats from the game against the Seahawks. Marvin Jones was probably the only Lions receiver that played good in that game. Do y'all remember all the drops we had? Ebron had two drops, Tate had a drop, and even Anquan Bolden had a drop. And these were not inaccurate passes, they were placed just fine. But aside from the drops, Anquan Bolden had two catches on six targets for 24 yards. He also had 23 penalty yards. He had one more receiving yard than he had yards and penalties. So your most reliable and experienced receiver wasn't giving you anything. Golden Tate wasn't exactly helping Stafford either, as he had three catches on five targets for 25 yards. And now you got Ebron, who on six targets had two catches for 23 yards. He had as many drops as he had catches. So on top of having three of your top four targets giving you almost nothing, Zach Zenner was averaging 3.1 yards per carry. And on top of even that, your defense was getting gashed all game long, to the tune of 177 rushing yards allowed. So in all honesty, you can almost argue that Stafford might have been the only line that showed up in that game. So just imagine being Stafford in that game. Your receivers are dropping passes, your ground game is giving you close to nothing, and on top of all that, your defense is getting gashed. Stafford and Wilson had almost identical stats at the end of the game, but the difference was that Wilson had players making one-handed catches, while Stafford had players dropping passes with two hands on the ball. Is it even up for debate that Wilson had the better supporting cast in that game? But now that I've explained what went wrong in the game against the Seahawks, I want to talk about his averages in the playoffs. Stafford, in his three playoff games, is averaging 302.7 yards, 1.3 touchdowns, and one interception per game. So let's find out how it stacks up to other Super Bowl caliber quarterbacks. Here's the playoff averages of Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, Joe Flacco, Ben Roethlisberger, Cam Newton, Tom Brady, Andrew Luck, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, Matt Ryan, and Jared Goff. Stafford's averaging over 300 passing yards per game in the playoffs and about 1.3 touchdown passes a game in the playoffs. So looking at the stats, it's at least a little bit closer than you all thought it would be, right? And it's not like these were garbage time yards and touchdowns. They were yards that had the lines up on the Saints heading into halftime. They were yards and touchdowns that had the Lions leading against the Cowboys for 57 minutes. And they were yards that had the Lions only down by one score heading into the fourth quarter against the Seahawks, despite getting almost no help from your receivers, tight ends, running backs, or defense. Stafford is averaging more passing yards per game than all of these quarterbacks in the playoffs. And the only one that very few people think highly of that I listed is Joe Flacco. Now, one thing that Stafford falls a little bit short of compared to these quarterbacks is the touchdown passes. Why are Stafford's touchdown averages lower than these guys? 
Well, there's actually quite a bit more explanations for it than you think. He didn't have a touchdown pass against the Seahawks, which brings his average down. And we have already mentioned that the receivers for the Lions in that game were mostly corpses. Also understand that every player that I decided to reference in this slide, except for Deshaun Watson and Jared Goff, has had more pro bowlers on the offensive side of the ball than Stafford. And Deshaun Watson and Jared Goff have only been starting for two years, basically. Even Andrew Luck, who has had almost no supporting cast around him, has had more Pro Bowlers on offense than Stafford. And trust me, having more Pro Bowlers and producing more touchdowns is very strongly correlated. But despite all of that, Stafford is averaging more yards per game than every one of these quarterbacks. And is not that far behind at least six of these guys when it comes to touchdowns. Has Stafford played out of his mind amazing in these games? No, he has not. Has he needed to play out of his mind amazing if the Lions were going to win? Yes, he has needed to. But was he a corpse in these games? Not at all. Will it ever be good enough to lead the Lions to a Super Bowl win? It absolutely will. Listen to these examples for me. Patrick Mahomes did not have a touchdown pass in his first playoff game. Andrew Luck did not have a touchdown pass in his first playoff game either. Tom Brady did not get his first postseason touchdown pass until his third playoff game. Russell Wilson averaged exactly one touchdown pass a game in his 2013 Super Bowl run. That's less than Stafford's 1.3 playoff average. So yes, it'll be good enough. And I do expect those averages to go up over time, assuming the Lions want to stick with him. And if the Lions make the postseason this year, I bet you he throws at least one touchdown pass in that game, and maybe even two or three. So, I did not talk about the fourth quarter comebacks in this video, but I did not think it was necessary. We all know about the fourth quarter comebacks, and they are great, but there's a lot of aspects that Stafford is also clutch in that he might not get enough credit for. Now, Stafford's fourth quarter magic hasn't been here in the last two years. Can Stafford get back to it? We will certainly need him to if we're going to have any chance. He did actually show that he still has it in the fourth quarter against the Cowboys and the Panthers. They lost the game to the Cowboys, but it shouldn't take away from the fact that before the Cowboys beat us on the field goal as time expired, Stafford drove the Lions right down the field and dropped a dime to Golden Tate to tie the game before Matt Prater kicked the go-ahead extra point. So we talked about his third down efficiency, where he's been very solid. However, Stafford's in a little bit of a slump with his red zone efficiency, but can he get it back up? This 2019 personnel has a lot of similarities to his best red zone years. You got Kenny Galladay, that is his big-bodied receiver, his good big-bodied receiver, and we also have two big-bodied tight ends in TJ Hawkinson and Jesse James. Even if Jesse James only ends up being as good as Tony Scheffler, it will be good enough at least in the red zone. And I think we can all agree that TJ Hawkinson is going to be better than Brandon Pettigrew or Joseph Fourier. Will he for sure? Would I bet money on it? Probably not, because I don't know. Because the draft is unpredictable. But I would have to think he will be. I would hope that Stafford can get back to his 2015 red zone efficiency with this particular offense that he'll be working with. I would hope that he hasn't forgotten how to utilize tight ends in the red zone or just be good in the red zone in general because it has been a long time since he has had this kind of personnel. But we will see how it all shapes out. Let me know in the comments. Is Stafford more clutch than you thought? He's certain. Eh. I guess he's about as clutch as I thought. He's extremely hit or miss. Well, that will be all for this episode. Thank you all for watching and I hope you all enjoyed. In the next episode, I'll be breaking down Stafford's awful record against winning teams. We all know it's very, very bad. It would make you think that there's no way we can win a Super Bowl with him. But I'll be breaking it down, why he has struggled to beat these teams, and that just maybe he doesn't deserve as much blame as you think for why he has struggled to beat teams with winning records. But thank you all again for watching, and stay tuned for Part 6.